Yes. You ran into my room.
Yeah, I did. Uh, I don't know if you guys can hear me, but I did. Um, I posted the the link with the instructions on how to get there, the password, Mr. Sharp, and I just sent us in another post that said that we are starting up here pretty soon. Perfect. 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 All right, people, fire away with questions. I'm glad you all got home before the rain came down because it's absolutely pouring right now. So I'd rather be stuck here uh, at my desk than driving in that. Does anybody want to know anything about the test? The test, the test, the test, the test. Um, okay, so Wobble is, um, oh, let's see. Do I have a code on chart handy? Hang tight. So, on your handy dandy little code on chart right here, um, you'll see that you know multiple codons can code for the same amino acid. Uh, so, for instance, UUA and UUG both code for leucine. Um, so, what that means is that it's really important to have that UU on the codon, which means the anti-codon for that would be AA, but it's possible, and I don't know exactly which ones have the, um, uh, which of the anti-codon on the T -T -R -A -T -R -NAs are like this, but some of them, instead of being like AAU, which should be the anti-codon that would match up with UUA, it might actually be UUG. And if it is, it still fits, right? So what the, the point of wobble is, is that when it comes to the anti-codon pairing up with the uh, the codon, when the TR, when the R, sorry, when the tRNA brings in the amino acid, is that 
really only the first two are super, super important. That sometimes that third base pairing for the tRNA with the messenger RNA is a little bit flexible. Basically, just use your codon chart. There's no questions about the wobble on there. Um, it's just what explains the, the redundancy in the codon chart. But good question, Amber. Thank you for asking. Um, no, we're really not. I mean, there's nothing beyond knowing that there are multiple levels of protein structure. I think you're probably okay, Ethan. Um, you don't have to know specifically what alpha helices or beta pleated sheets look like, but they are the secondary structure of, of, um, of protein structure, secondary level of protein structure. What do we, uh, is that, um, is that a post-transcriptional or post-translational um, type of modification or uh, regulation on the final shape of the protein? Anyone can type their answer to that. It is, yes, Ethan. It is post-translational, but you didn't say you said post question mark. Yes, post-translational, because it's after the actual amino acid sequence has been translated. Okay. Uh, Miss Cecilia says, can you please go over the differences we need to know regarding eukaryotes and bacteria? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, a lot of what we know about eukaryotic gene expression, we learn from studying bacteria because they're cheap and they're easy and no one cares if we kill them and study them. Um, but there are some like some very important differences. So the main difference is the lack of a nucleus, right? So there's no separation between where they do DNA replication, where they do transcription, and where they do uh, translation. It's all right there together. So they can do transcription and translation simultaneously, right? As soon as they start transcribing a gene onto messenger RNA, there are no modifications that have to be done. There's no uh, nothing that has to happen to that mRNA. It will immediately bind to a ribosome, and you'll immediately start to have um, uh, you'll immediately start to have translation occurring, and amino acid sequences being built, even while the messenger RNA is still being built. Um, so that's the, the very first and main difference: is that there's no difference at all. There's no separation between transcription and translation in prokaryotes. And as we went over today in class, there's a major separation between transcription and translation in eukaryotes, right? We have a very nice, thick, uh, protective cell mem uh, uh, nuclear membrane, which keeps the DNA inside the nucleus. It keeps everything else, all the machinery that's part of translation outside of the nucleus. And so therefore we have to modify, manipulate, and process the messenger RNA so it can leave the nucleus and head out into the cytosol to find a ribosome for translation. Um, that would be the, the most important difference between eukaryotic and prokaryotic gene expression. Um, I'm trying to think of what else we talked about that was the difference between them. I mean, obviously, prokaryotes have one chromosome. They don't have multiple chromosomes. Our chromosomes as eukaryotes are linear. Theirs are kind of looped. Um, not exactly like a perfect circle, but they are looped and convoluted. So they only have one origin of replication, and then it works its way all the way around the chromosome, the looped chromosome. Whereas we have, you know, on our linear chromosomes, we'll have multiple, up to hundreds or even thousands of replication bubbles on the same linear chromosome. So we have a lot of origin of replication um, when, we're, when we're replicating our DNA. They just have the one point of origin, the one origin of replication. But that's a good. It's a good question, Cecilia. Hope I answered it for you. Though. It's good. We're up to thirteen participants. Get some more questions in here, people.
a ribozyme is a um, it's a ribonucleic enzyme. So it's just an it's an enzyme that is made of RNA instead of being made of protein. Uh, the, the main two ribozymes that we'll talk about are the the catalytic portion of a ribosome itself is made up of ribosomal RNA, and so it is a ribozyme. And then the spliceosomes, the enzyme part of spliceosome, the one that actually facilitates the cutting of the introns and then the splicing together of the exons, that is an RNA molecule as well. And so both spliceosomes and ribosomes can be thought of as ribozymes. So it's just a, an enzyme that's not a protein, it's an RNA molecule instead. Um, the amino acetyl tRNA synthetase is just the enzyme that that takes, you know, it's got basically a really big active site, and it fits a transfer RNA into one part of it, and it fits the correct amino acid into the other part of it, and facilitates the bonding of the amino acid to the uh, to the tRNA. So when when we say that a tRNA is charged. That means that it has an amino acid attached to it. The right amino acid, hopefully. Um, and so therefore it is, uh, it's, it's already gone through the amino acetyl tRNA synthetase process. Um, and if there's just a tRNA that doesn't have an amino acid on there, it's called an uncharged tRNA. It will be very, very, very similar to your worksheet, Taylor. Um, in fact, I was just printing it out a little while ago and checking over it. Um, basically, it'll be almost exactly the same. So you'll have to know how to go back and forth between RNA and DNA. Uh, you'll have to know how to process and modify a messenger RNA strand, uh, making sure that you've got a cap on there, you've got a tail on there, you can recognize where the UTRs are, the untranslated regions at both the five prime and three prime end, that you can properly pull an intron out, slide, an exon, slide the exons over, and recognize where to start your reading frame, right? The most important thing is that you start on that five prime end and you read across until you get to an AUG, right? So you don't set your reading frame at the beginning, you set it once, once you get to a, uh, the AUG, that's when you start, set your reading frame, and then everything after that is read in codons, those groups of three. It's really pouring down out there. Can you guys hear the rain? Ooh, we're up to 17 people. I saw Miss Ames right as she was walking out the door. I told her what I was doing, and she was very excited about it. She said, Ooh, let me know how it goes. So, you guys, keep asking questions, and I will give her a good report and tell her that she has to do it the next time for an AP chem test. Can the nucleoid be coiled like eukaryotic DNA to reduce the chance that a gene is expressed? If a nucleoid is a. So, the nucleoid is the region. It's just like the nucleated region of the, the center of a bacterium. Um, it doesn't really have like a defined area. So the, the, the chromosome itself, um, I believe it does have, they, they, they can have some modifications, but they really don't want to shut off a whole lot of it. I mean, back, their lifespan is so short. They pretty much, if there's genes on there that they need to complete their life cycle, they're pretty much just going to express them all the time. Um, is, is all the DNA transcribed at once by one prokaryotic RNA polymerase? How does it stop? No, it doesn't. There are specific genes, um, and we'll actually talk about this. The first section of chapter 18 on operons, it talks about promoter regions, and there's actually a specific ending portion to 
a gene on bacteria. We don't have a specific ending portion on eukaryotic genes, but there is a terminator. So there is a there is a defined promoter and a defined terminator on prokaryotic genes. So no, there's they read one gene at a time unless it's part of an operon in which they can read multiple genes at a time until they get to the terminator sequence. I kind of wish I had not left my umbrella in the car. It sounds like someone's eating a snack and now you're making me hungry. That's just cruel, man. Mm. Hi, Lexi. Um, so the anti-codon is simply the, it's the little sequence of nucleotides, of three nucleotides on the bottom end, essentially, of a transfer RNA. Um, and it base pairs briefly with the codon. So it's, it's just how we get the right transfer RNA into that A site, the amino acetyl site in the ribosome. Remember how we have the A, the P, and the E. Um, so basically, it's the ribosome looks at the, it looks at the codon sequence on the messenger RNA. And then it sure has the right transfer RNA because it should pair up. The anti-codon should pair up with the, the codon. Um, but like I said, with wobble, it really is only always important to have the first two nucleotides be correct in that base pairing. Um, sometimes you need all three of them correct, but sometimes just the first two. So anticodons are simply just, um, they will be complementary to, the, according to the base pairing rules, will be complementary RNA nucleotides with the codon. So if a codon is, um, if a codon is AAA, then the anticodon that pairs up with that would be UUU. But you don't use the anticodon on here, right? You use your, your codon chart is the codons off of messenger RNA. So really the only time you need to look at an anticodon would be if you're just ensuring that the right transfer RNA comes in to pair up with messenger RNA. But you're more concerned about the amino acid on the transfer RNA than you are about what the anticodon is. You know about how different errors spliceosomes make affect an organism? Um, I mean, so errors are always a good thing to think of, right, when you're preparing for a test, because a lot of times test questions are, you know, they describe a process and they say, well, what would happen if this went wrong or that went wrong? So, yeah, I mean, like, you could absolutely think about if a spliceosome made a cutting error and maybe it left an intron in, Right, so you had your messenger, or you had your RNA transcript, with your RNA transcript, and you're supposed to pull part of it out, like pull the intron out, but instead you left that in. How would that affect the final message? Well, it's going to throw off the reading frame. You might have uh, missent uh, errors in there because you have too many. Um, right? Whoever is eating the potato chips, that's really loud. Um, uh, it might have. Um, Missense errors because you put the wrong amino acids in sequence, or it could, uh, it might actually like you can make a new novel shape to a protein that can do something different in the end. But specific problems, no. It's always like general. Like basically, what would happen if this went wrong? Well, if a spliceosome didn't cut out the, the right intron, then the final mature messenger RNA would have the wrong sequence. So then it, it may affect whether or not there is, uh, it could be uh, nonsense if it inserts a stop codon too early. It could be a missense error if it just puts the wrong things in order over time, like it just changes the order of amino acids. But there's no specific consequence that you need to know about. Uh, the role of chaperonins is, 
is one of its post-translational modification. So basically, it's just taking that amino acid sequence, that primary structure of, of the protein, and putting it into an environment that will fold it up into the right shape or form. Oftentimes, chaperonins are used for enzymes that are going to be freely floating and used in the cytosol. So if it is an enzyme that's going to do some activity right there in the cytosol of the cell, then um, it might be formed, shaped by a chaperonin. It's just another way to get to fold it, right? To fold a amino acid sequence into the right structure. Really not all that different than what happens inside a uh, the lumen of the ER or inside of a Golgi apparatus when proteins get shipped there. They're always going to be folded differently or shaped differently or having things added onto them. The chaperonin just creates a slightly different microenvironment around the, the uh, around the amino acid sequence of the polypeptide and just shapes into the right form. Okay, uh, the Hershey experiment. Uh, what about the Hershey experiment should we understand for Thursday? Um, nothing for Thursday. The Hershey experiment is actually, there's a couple of multiple choice questions about it. So again, like we talked about today, uh, the Hershey Chase experiment was the one where they used the radioactive sulfur and the radioactive phosphorus to determine that, um, that nucleic acids were the genetic material and not proteins. So basically, you know, what they did is they took you know, viruses that had radioactive proteins and they let them infect bacteria. And so what they did is they checked to see, did any of the radioactive material go inside the bacteria? So if the radioactive material went inside the bacteria when they had radioactive sulfur, that would I mean, the proteins were going into bacteria, but they didn't get that, right? All the radioactive sulfur stayed outside of the bacteria. When they had the viruses that had radioactive phosphorus, which meant that their DNA was radioactive, they, again, they let them infect the bacteria, then they looked at the bacteria. Sure enough, the radioactive material was inside the bacteria. It wasn't on the outside. So that's how they knew that it was DNA that was going into the bacteria, and that's what was causing the bacteria to have its, uh, to start producing viral proteins. So basically the virus was taking control of the bacteria through DNA, not through proteins. So that's the main thing, right? Uh, radioactive phosphorus went in, radioactive sulfur stayed out. So that's how they prove that it was, um, it was nucleic acid that was the genetic material. Um, Paul asks, what's the role of primase? So primase is the enzyme that can build that short little RNA primer during replication that DNA polymerase can attach to and then build off of. So remember, DNA polymerase can read across the street, right? It can say, okay, there's my complementary strand of DNA, my template strand. So I'm going to say, you know, I, I can read that and I know what nucleotide I have to put on this side. But it has to attach to something first. So it has to attach to that RNA primer. So a primer is a very short sequence of RNA nucleotides that is base paired with the template strand of DNA. RNA polymerase attaches to it and then starts reading the DNA and build, reading the DNA template strand and building new DNA. But primase can work. Primase is kind of like RNA polymerase, right? It can read across and lay down RNA nucleotides without needing something to build off. It doesn't have to attach to something and like use that as a base to build off of. It can just read and build across from the template strand. This is by far the quietest my room has been all day long. No, Paul, that's a good question. There are multiple DNA polymerases, and I know that your book describes DNA polymerase 1, DNA polymerase 2, and DNA polymerase 3 in E. coli. Um, for our purposes, just know that anything called a DNA polymerase is an enzyme that can synthesize a DNA polymer by adding in those DNA nucleotides in order. Um, but no, I'm not requiring you guys to know like the different ones.
No, uh, Cecilia, to answer your question, no, the only one that I really want you to know about is it, it, it is a semi-conservative process. So like you need to know that. Um, first one, uh, I erased the picture on the board. I actually drew a really good picture during the uh, seventh period of the, someone asked about the um, dispersive model and the conservative model, what they would look like. Um, so I drew that, but no, just know that DNA is a semi-conservative process. So that means that when you have your original two DNA strands and your original molecule, when they separate out, they are both used as a template and you build a new strand off of that so that each of your new molecules of DNA has one old strand and one new strand, one old strand, one new strand. I was going to try and see if I can share my... If you guys can see this, maybe you can. Uh, let's see if this works very well. So if you have your... Uh, why will not let me... What's going on? I'm trying to write on my two quick notes, maybe. Whatever. All right, your untech savvy teacher just tried to like show you how to. Uh, I was going to draw it on my one note page, but it wouldn't let me. You can share your screen. So on the bottom where it says share, you click that share button, the green button. Yeah. It should say share your screen. Entire screen, application window. Just do your entire screen to make it easier on yourself. There it goes. All right. Um, and they can see that? Whatever. I went over here. Ooh, draw. Maybe that's it. Okay, let's see. I want to let me. Are you guys seeing this? This is crazy. Uh, all right, what happened to my change the color? Pretty good. Do you guys see that? I hope you did. It was it was marvelous artwork. Um, okay, let's see. No one wants to know. Can translation occur in any stage of the cell cycle? Uh, pretty much any stage except for mitosis. Ah, uh, you didn't see the art. Uh, whatever. I tried to share it. Um, so yeah, pretty much all of interface. Uh, to to uh, Paul, you answered the question correctly. Um, in G1 and in S phase and in G2, translation can be occurring out in the cytosol. Um, it cannot happen during mitosis because, you know, the whole cell is basically, everything shuts down and all the energy is concentrated on making sure that chromosomes form up properly, they line up properly, they get separated properly, and all that. Uh, let's see, hold on. Uh, my daughter is asking me if I can run leggings to her at uh, dance class right now. I don't think she realizes where I am. I'm going to text her real quick and let her know. Back. So the origin of replication will be inside of the replication bubble. All right, let's see if I can do this better this time. Entire screen, share. All right, so do you guys see that? What do y'all see? Do y'all see that? 
Well, I, I don't know why I'm talking. You guys aren't talking back. New page, draw. Yeah, we can all see it. We saw your drawing. Okay, cool. All right. So if I'm drawing my replication bubble inside there, I would say that my origin of replication is kind of right in the middle of the bubble. And then I use a different color, right, to draw my new strands, right? So there's my leading strand, and then there's my uh, Okazaki fragments on my lagging strand. Right, so there's my origin of replication right there and right there on either side. Now this is a eukaryotic cell. If I was talking about a prokaryotic cell, Right, so if that's my original, if that's my original thing, and I picked like that area right there to be my origin of replication, and then it kind of And I was making my new DNA inside there. So there'd be one origin of replication. Okay, now let's try to use my finger. Origin, oh, that's terrible. Origin of replication right there. Jeez. Um, one origin of replication right there on a prokaryotic cell. Whereas every single replication bubble would have an origin of replication on a eukaryotic chromosome. So again, there would be dozens, hundreds, even thousands of origins of replication per chromosome in a eukaryotic organism. We're back. Oh, I know you're gonna ask that, let's see. Um, all right, well, hold on. Does the removal of introns happen before the mRNA is sent to the ribosome? Absolutely. So it's a good question, Justin. All post-transcriptional modifications happen inside of the nucleus. So absolutely, before it goes out to the ribosome, those modifications have to be done inside the nucleus. Um, the enzymes that put on the cap, put on the tails, and the spliceosomes uh, that, that do the uh, excising of the introns and pulling together the exons all of those are inside the nucleus. So all of those modifications have to occur inside the nucleus before it leaves. Okay, Amber, uh, let's go back to that drawing. That was a really good question. Where was it? Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the, the eukaryotic one, right? So we'll say the eukaryotic one. Uh, and so your question is, which one is five prime, which one's three prime here, okay? Well, remember that DNA is or DNA polymerase is always going to read the original strand in the three prime to five prime direction. So if I'm reading this way, that means that is my five prime. That's three prime. And because my other side had to be anti parallel, well, that's three prime. And that's five prime. But then, so on these down here, right? That would be five prime to three prime, right? Because you build five to three. And I'm just putting it on the stuff that I've built so far, right? And then that would be five, and that would be three. And that should make sense, right? Because this new strand right here, right? The red one on the top right there, it's going to eventually be, you know, five prime 
and this will be three prime. So that will be down there eventually. So uh, you can always tell because you're always going to be going five prime to three prime towards a replication fork. So the arrow going towards the replication fork, right, should be going five to three. So you always build in the five prime to three prime direction. You read three prime to five prime. Okay, so, all right, Amber, I hope that answered your question. Uh, let's see, Taylor said, can you re-explain how, oh, wait, wait, wait. can you re-explain how polymerase reads five to three, but reads three to five? So it reads the old strand, it reads the template strand three to five, right? Which means it's building five to three, because when you are done building, Right, when you're done building, uh, let's see, can you just make a new space down here at the bottom? Let's say that was three and that was five. So this is my original strand of DNA. So up here, polymerase is going to start reading three to five, right? So it's going to read, that's an A, and that's a C, and that's a G, and that's a C, and that's a T. So it's going to build the new strand this way, five. to three. So it's going to put that in first and then that and that and that and that. So I read my original from three to five and I build my new one from five to three. All right, and so then down here. I would start reading here. And I would start right there when I'm building, right? Because I'm going to have to build in the five prime to three prime direction. So I would say uh, that's a T, a T, and then a G, and then a C. I would be going, you know, that direction. Uh, Taylor, I hope that answered your question. Okay, Paul, when is mRNA and tRNA used? Um, messenger RNA is always going to carry the code, right? Carry the essentially the the exon um, or exons from the DNA, right? So the code of the the absolute blueprint for how to build this polypeptide is carried on the mRNA. And it's going to hold on to that. It takes it out into the cytosol. Ribosome finds it, starts reading it. tRNA is only used to bring in the right amino acid. So as the ribosome is reading the messenger RNA, it's like a doctor like saying, you know, scalpel, sponge, whatever. It's, you know, the, the ribosome is calling for the right tRNA based on the codon it reads on the messenger RNA. And then it brings in the right thing, adds in the right amino acid. So they're both used during translation. Wait, does I have two amino acids? Three? Oh, I didn't realize I had not scrolled down. Uh, what do SNRPs do? So the SNRPs are the small nuclear ribonucleoproteins. They're part of a spliceosome. So the only thing you need to know about SNRPs is that they are involved in cutting out introns, uh, pulling exons together. So all of any, anything with modification of RNA that involves a spliceosome. So alternative RNA splicing, exon shuffling, 
any removal of introns, SNRPs are involved in all of that. What exactly is ribosomal RNA? Um, it is, well, all RNA is single-stranded nucleotides, right? Ribos uh, uh, ribonucleic nucleotides. Um, and then, you know, mRNA pretty much stays linear. It stays a straight line. We know that transfer RNA, remember how it folds up into that three-dimensional shape? It looks kind of like a cloverleaf when it's flattened out, and it looks kind of like an L or an R um, when it is in three-dimensional form. It's got an amino acid on one side, anticodon on the other. Ribosomal RNA makes up structure of part of the structure of the ribosome. So it's kind of globular and globby, right? It's, um, I mean, it, it makes up the structure of the ribosome, but it also acts as an enzyme inside there. Pranit says, what's the difference between telomeres and the five prime cap? Um, well, telomeres are on DNA. The five prime cap is on a messenger RNA. So telomeres can be like 15 to 18,000 uh, nucleotides long. They're really, really, really long uh, sections of DNA, whereas a five prime cap is a very, very short head that goes onto the messenger RNA molecule. Uh, Paul asked what Tata box is. Uh, the Tata box is a common promoter for eukaryotic genes. So it's basically like if you're reading along the, the DNA, the template strain of the DNA, um, and you're like looking for a promoter region, you're looking for where you think a gene might start, Tata box is a, um, a good thing to start looking for. Um, now, it's common because, you know, it makes sense that a very similar promoter region would be found found on all of eukaryotic genes because you have to call in those general transcription factors. So general transcription factors will, will come up to the Tata box and like they'll start to build that transcription initiation complex there. Um, we're going to learn more in chapter 18 to talk about regulation of eukaryotic genes, uh, gene expression, is this, the, the specific transcription factors that are really going to make sure that the right gene is being expressed in the right cell at the right time. General transcription factors are basically like, um, it's just a way to set up the thing to hold RNA polymerase, um, but you have to have specific transcription factors there first to take those general transcription factors and build our transcription initiation complex. But all that happens at the Tata box. So the Tata box is literally just a segment of, of nucleotides, a very specific sequence of nucleotides on the DNA will begin, or it's kind of like the beginning point for transcription. Um, Cecilia asks if we need to know the difference between euchromatin and heterochromatin. Um, I don't think there's a question on there about that, but euchromatin, so the way I remember this, right, is you can express genes when they are on euchromatin. So euchromatin is the portion of the DNA or the, of the, the chromatin that is more kind of loosened and opened up. So there's more access to the genes. There's more access to the, the actual DNA code for a transcription initiation complex to attach to. Um, heterochromatin is an area that is kind of like, like packed up tightly. Um, it's not super coiled up. It's just kind of like packed up tightly around the histones. So they wrap, the histones are the little balls of proteins that the DNA is wrapped around. And then they actually will come closer together and all the histones in an area can kind of like squeeze together. And you really make some compacted, really dense areas of DNA that make it impossible to build a transcription initiation complex. So the RNA polymerase can't get access to uh, the DNA. It can't read a gene on there. It's just basically it's a way of shutting down an area of DNA because either A, you don't want that gene to be expressed right now, or B, that gene does not need to be expressed in this particular type of cell.
Clock's running down. Anyone going to take a last minute shot? Five forty five, just getting weird, y'all. It's Taco Tuesday tonight. I'm tacos at the house. Should be good. Hopefully the uh, the nanny will um chop up some fresh avocados. I like a little, little avocado in my um tacos. Hey, can you explain the binding sites for, for transfer RNA? Ooh, shall we draw again? Let's draw. I like drawing. Remember, ribosome kind of looks like that, right? There's your small subunit, your large subunit. And your messenger RNA is going to feed through that way. All right, we read it five prime to three prime. And then there are, essentially, there are three binding sites. There's the E site, and there's the P site, and there's the A site. The A site stands for amino acetyl site. So that's where your tRNA with an amino acid on it is going to first come into the ribosome. So let's just say, and here's your exit tunnel. All right, so there's a transfer RNA, and it's in the, it's in the P site. It's pretty much as soon as, well, I'll, I'll do this. Draw one right here. And there's a transfer RNA with an amino acid on it in the A site. So as soon as this gets in there, we are going to facilitate the building of a peptide bond from there to there. And while we do that, the ribozyme, so this rRNA that makes up the structure of the ribosome, when it builds that bond, right, it facilitates the building of that bond, it has to break that bond to do that. And when it does that, this transfer RNA will move over to the E site. And now our polypeptide chain is attached to this transfer RNA. When that moves over there, that allows this to move over there, and that frees up the A site for the next amino acid coming in. Now, meanwhile, whatever was here, right? So let's say that was a C, G, U. Right. Um, that's this is all those codons are on messenger RNA, and they're just going to keep sliding in that direction. Right. And the whole thing is going to move to our left, and then whatever is next. Right. Let's say the next codon here was a C G. Right, that's going to move in front of the A site, and so then the transfer RNA that has the proper amino acid for ACG will come in. It'll be the next one into the A site. I really hope that uh, made sense, Amber. Uh, so, what does the A site do, Lexi? It um, it literally is just, I mean, it's the, it's the binding site for a trans, for the next transfer RNA that's going to bring its amino acid into sequence. The A and the P site, they're, they're literally just, it's just like a little, it's an area in the ribosome 
And so we go from A to P to E, the transfer RNA, the charge transfer RNA, what's called an amino acetyl transfer RNA. Uh, it will come in, it will bind at the A site. And then as soon as the, the peptide bond is switched over to its amino acid, it'll translocate, translocate over to the P site. And then another amino acid will come into the A site. I'm sorry, another transfer RNA with an amino acid on it will come into the A site. Switch the bond again. And then now the transfer RNA that was in the P site goes to the E site and goes away. The one that was in the A site moves over to the P site. So it goes A, then P, then E. Uh, on biomanbio.com, there's a game under the section life chemistry called protein synthesis race, and it really helps with understanding protein synthesis. Well, there you go. That sounds like something fun you guys can do as a good review tonight. Maybe I'll check it out and see if it's fun and exciting. Maybe, maybe if we could play each other uh, in a race, it sounds like it's a race, um, maybe we can play uh, later on. I'll be logged on as I don't know, Captain Protein. I don't know. All right, it is 5.51, and it is time for me to go home to my Taco Tuesday. So uh, I hope you guys all enjoyed this. I hope it was helpful. Uh, if you have any more questions, feel free to email them to me tonight. Uh, I might be on. Thank you, Amber. I appreciate that. Um, I might be on uh, line later on. Uh,